Albania, the poorest country in Europe, ripe for development, but also ripe for exploitation. 2,000 miles away in Buckinghamshire, this terrace house is the unlikely starting point for schemes which have cost the British taxpayer more than a million pounds, and given the Albanians absolutely nothing. The Princess of Wales and the Duchess of York have been used without their knowledge to promote investment schemes. We do work very, very closely with the, the, the British government. One man is sitting at the heart of this web. Tonight, the Cook Report reveals how your money has disappeared. All forms of uh, shady dealing become possible in a country like Albania, which has suffered total destruction. We have no private banks here. And this is the best situation for the sharks. It's called the only third world country in Europe, and it is. I mean, the poverty in Albania is unbelievable. These were the scenes in 1991 which heralded the end of Europe's most ruthless communist regime in Albania. A student revolt started in Tirana, the capital. It swept the whole country and the government was defeated in a series of confrontations. Sali Berisha emerged as democratic leader and was hailed as a savior. What had begun as a protest against high rents and poor services became the mass movement which catapulted Albania back into Europe and Berisha onto the world stage. He traveled to London to be greeted by the Conservative Party deputy chairman, Geoffrey Patty. The Conservative Party had prepared local election leaflets for Berisha in 1992 and, quite improperly, shipped them out in a diplomatic bag. Also there to glad hand Berisha was Baroness Chalker, the Minister for Overseas Development. Albania, sandwiched between Greece and Yugoslavia, was the last stronghold of Stalinism. Having fallen out with the Russians and with the Chinese, the country became a fortress, isolated from its neighbours, which could explain the 600,000 gun emplacements which litter its borders. After the hardline regime toppled, aid flooded in from Western Europe. British charities were amongst the first to arrive, but close on their heels came the speculators who saw the chance to make a fast buck. The sharks are coming. I think, I think that this fact comes from the Albanian reality. We have no private banks here. And this is the best situation for the sharks. And its economy still dominated by the underground uh, economic movement like uh, petrol smuggling with Serbia or weapon smuggling with everybody and uh, controlled mainly from the segments in the government. But the sharks inside Albania are not alone. Others are attracted from outside the country. Former ambassador Sir Reg Hibbert explains. People who go to Albania tend to be a rag bag of adventurers who go there simply to find out for themselves something new, something exciting, who have no background knowledge of the country, and who have no central guiding principle or guiding line which could be said to be a form of policy. But of course, amongst that rag bag of adventurers, there'll be people who are only in it for the money. I'm afraid that's so. Some people are there just for money, but some people go there not quite sure what they're going for, and then find that money is a possibility that uh, corruption, um, illegal trade, smuggling, um, all forms of uh, shady dealing become possible in a country like Albania, which has suffered total destruction. But you don't need that catalogue of crimes to profit in Albania. Andre Axford flourished on a mixture of waste and incompetence when he set himself up as Britain's commercial representative. There is no British embassy in Albania, and to begin with, not even a chargé d'affaires. So it was no surprise that Axford was able to pass himself off as Britain's official representative. 
through his office in Tirana, have passed plans attracting more than a million pounds in British and European grants. But so far, not one project has materialized. These people were promised cheap houses. The British government put in some start-up money. What they got was absolutely nothing. In a separate scheme, the people of this village were promised roads, electricity and a water supply that was available more than twice a day. Again, the British government put in money. Again, the villagers got nothing, except the promise of the last thing they needed, a luxury hotel and a golf course. We decided to investigate. Posing as builders keen to invest in Albania, we started with a phone call to the Department of Trade and Industry in London. He must have come across him. He runs the Albanian commercial office. He's actually a consultant. What he does is basically what we do is promoting trade between the UK and Albania. He makes money out of it. But, I mean, he really is the man with the contacts um, at the moment. He, he, he's out there practically every month um, and he's working on behalf of a number of British companies, so he really does know his stuff. He's run by a chap called Andre Axford. A ringing endorsement from the DTI. But when we asked the DTI to discuss the level of their involvement with Axford, they disappeared behind a diplomatic smokescreen, leaving it to the Foreign Office to issue a statement on their behalf. And all that statement would admit was that at one stage, Axford was given a one-off grant to help him start a magazine. More of that magazine later. And in conclusion, the Foreign Office spokesman said that if any businessman pointed towards Axford had had problems, that was their fault. It was very much a case of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Axford's office in England is his terrace house, not a setting likely to inspire confidence. So he uses hotels for business meetings. So we'll go the side. We're looking for somebody out here, Mr. Axford. We were meeting here. Axford was keen to name drop his impressive connections especially royal ones. The Duchess of York went out there last year. Uh, he's dating her Princess of Wales. Uh, princess dies, Scotland out there. Uh, you know, there are a lot of connections. Right. Axford's shop front office in Tirana is the target for another of our undercover teams. This is the office, commercial, Albanian commercial office, United Kingdom. That uh, is to do with uh, English investments here, to bring different investor clubs, also organize uh, trade missions. Once they're satisfied with our bona fides, we're introduced to Axford's partner in Albania, Spartak Nano Meltzer, who's keen to talk about the projects he and Axford have an interest in. There are a lot of people investing now. And uh, Spartak deals also with construction. Ah, oh, oh, good. Different industry, different uh, industry, different industry, different things such as uh, uh, villages, uh, factories, uh, buildings. They have constructed and they finished the first uh, touristic village in Albania. It's the site of uh, Doros. As he shows us round, Meltzer boasts about his connections in government. But he doesn't tell us the reason. He was formerly a high-ranking member of the Albanian secret police. Dorset builder Simon Mullane is more concerned with financial than with political considerations. His story is typical of those who've had dealings with Axford and the Albanian commercial office. First of all, I'm upstairs. Again. Mr. Axford uh, would not deal with us at all until he was paid a retainer uh, on a monthly basis, which had to be uh, in cleared funds before I first landed in uh, Albania. As one by one East Europe's communist regimes fell, Western governments became concerned that revolution could degenerate into anarchy. To prevent this, and to oil the wheels of capitalism, the West developed a raft of grants, like the Know-How Fund, to encourage businesses to invest. But these funds also provided golden opportunities for people like Axford. He explained about the Know-How Grants, and we received the application forms for this. And he said that he would act as our consultant in obtaining and carrying out a pre-investment feasibility study, uh, which was quite normal, and he had a 100% success rate on uh, acquiring this grant. Thus encouraged, Mr. Mullane started work on his project. Much needed homes for Albanians, not a bit of it. 
It seemed that what Axford had got clearance for was a block of 20 luxury apartments. This particular site was informed that there was clear title and that building permission had already been obtained. But when Mr. Mullane returned to Tirana, he got a shock and a demand for yet more money. There was problems with with uh, people that were living on the land that shouldn't have been there. Uh, squatters that we were told as soon as we started would be evicted. Uh, but we were told that we must pay $20,000 before this could happen. Uh, and Mr. Axford pressed very hard for this money before I went to Albania uh, and while I was in Albania. And worse was to come. The question of land ownership was far from clear. These contracts never actually gave us the right to own the building that we were building. And the people that had bought the apartments from us already, uh, they never actually obtained ownership. Basically, we would build a building uh, which we never owned and would sell the apartments, but the people that bought them would never own them. He pulled out of the project, having lost a quarter of a million pounds. He used the Albanian Observer, an independent magazine, to attack Axford and the Albanian commercial office in an advert. He warned off other potential investors. The Albanian government seized the magazine and pulped all the copies they could find. Mr. Mullane wasn't the only loser. Albania's one-time deputy prime minister, Dr. Gramos Pashko, is now living in exile in Washington. He says the Albanian people also lost. Albania is the poorest country in Europe in desperate need for aid, especially from Great Britain. And uh, unfortunately, we got people like Axford, these kind of pirates. But Axford wasn't playing pirate when we secretly filmed him. Instead, he offered reassurance that problems over land ownership were things of the past. Most of the cases have been resolved by the courts. As a consequence, the, the, the government has now passed a law allowing foreigners to purchase land. And he told us how to trick our way into getting British government grants from the know-how fund. At least we could rent. There are grants available from the UK government. The, the whole concept is that you are uh, doing a study to establish a joint venture. A joint venture doesn't actually have to happen. And this is why this is the way you get around it. Okay. But you have to go in on the basis that you're going to do a joint venture. It's with the government. But it only takes place after, the, after you've funded one visit. Okay. They've, got to share, they've got to see that you're serious. Then what you do is you get an application into the know-how fund for a joint, uh, for a, a pre-investment feasibility study, which will give you uh, up to 50% of the cost, up to a maximum of 50,000 pounds. What if we get turned over for some reason? How can you be certain? Well, it seems an extraordinary situation. We seem to have a freelance buccaneer wrapped in the Union Jack, uh, pretending, or at least being taken for, a British representative. And a freelance foreign policy and a trade and industry policy is being pursued to the disappointment of the long-suffering Albanians who have suffered decades of deprivation from the most bizarre, grotesque form of communism and are now being rather let down by British capitalism in this new era. Well, you have a kind of frontier spirit uh, at large in uh, Albania. It is new virgin territory for business and for capitalism. It's a time warp, a museum, uh, quite unique in Europe. And such a kind of Klondike will always attract the buccaneer and the unscrupulous. But it's for the British government to make sure that whatever British buccaneers are doing there, they're not doing it in the name of Her Majesty's government. And that must, therefore, be a criticism of the British Foreign Office, principally. Martin Stent worked for the Scottish builders McCrae Brothers, one of the companies Axford helped with know-how grants. He'd met Axford at a CBI reception. I don't know the, the, the full details of his relationship at the time, but I think he'd been instrumental in helping to bring the Albanian people across. And, and so, obviously, had it not been for that, we wouldn't have been faced with, with uh, the opportunity in the first place, really. And uh, it was, I suppose, um, yeah, it was, it was a, a, obviously a, a comfort to know that somebody knew somebody and that 
could give you an insight into other things about the country. McRae's first project, a factory to make timber frames for houses, failed because of unsuitable materials. Those frames were to have been used for Project 2, a housing development. The third plan was for a tourist resort, but one by one the project collapsed, much to the British government's embarrassment because Baroness Chalker, Minister for Overseas Development, attended a signing ceremony in Tirana to launch the housing project. We took advantage of a visit by Baroness Chalker to focus the municipality's mind. Time tends to run on sometimes with negotiations, and we knew that she was coming anyway. And having had their original involvement through the know-how fund, which hadn't proved successful, we felt that it would be good that she could see and that the municipality would have a chance to demonstrate that things could happen here. Things didn't happen. Once again, it was problems with the ownership of the land which caused the project to be scrapped. Finally, the McRae's also pulled out of the tourist resort. Unbelievably, McRae's see the collapses as a vindication of the know-how fund grants. Within that area, you could be uh, uh, having different environments for, for the... Martin Stent has stayed on in Albania, trying to resurrect the plan to build a tourist resort north of the port of Durres. This is the area where the proposed tourist complex would be built. A coastline littered with bunkers and gun emplacements. Nearby, the land is polluted with lindane, a chemical used for treating timber, which is now banned as a serious health risk. The lindane factory has been abandoned, and the land needs prohibitively expensive decontamination. A confidential report says that children here are falling ill with skin diseases. An urgent health check is now needed on the whole population. To the south of the port of Durres, Axford is advertising his own pet scheme. Once again, the Albanian people are not considered. They need houses, roads, electricity, water and a new sewage system. What Axford has in mind is luxury housing and holiday chalets. Bristol travel agent Neil Taylor has been going to Albania since 1975 and says the holiday developments are neither needed nor well sighted. I cannot now see people wanting to spend a week or two weeks on the beach at Durez because it is so near to a port. It simply isn't a seaside resort and it cannot become a seaside resort. We might have tourist groups spending a night there if they want to see the amphitheatre or for curiosity value, but certainly it won't appeal to long-stay tourists. Axford is promoting his Durres scheme in Britain at its best, a magazine he started with that grant from the DTI. The magazine looks official, but it isn't. It boasts in association with the Department of Trade and Industry and is emblazoned with the Royal Coat of Arms. And what about the Royal Connections Axford boasted about at an earlier meeting? I think it's a Duchess of York went out there last year. Uh, the Duchess of Princess of um, Princess Dies, got land out there. Um, you know, there are a lot of connections. Right. Buckingham Palace dismissed the suggestion that the Princess of Wales owns land in Albania as absolute nonsense. The Duchess of York has been to Albania. With her went Alan Starkey, a partner with her infamous financial advisor John Bryan in a building firm. The Duchess says that Starkey's company, Oceanics, did no business in Albania. But her charity, Children in Crisis, says they'd be very interested if we have evidence to the contrary. Theo Ellett, co-founder of the charity with the Duchess, says Starkey did tout for business. Alan Starkey was... He wasn't there to represent Oceanics. He was there, if you like, as an um, unofficial bodyguard, as I was unofficial lady-in-waiting. But nevertheless, Oceanics had a product called Dock in the Box, which was... Uh, a sort of a prefabricated clinic which could have fitted in very nicely. Um, he brought all the proposals. 
I was there. I was sitting in on the meeting. I was saying, well, this is exactly what you want. Because it was, but it was too expensive, and they didn't want to spend that amount of money. The Duchess of York's three-day charity visit was spent touring orphanages and hospitals. She described the conditions in some of them as an unbelievable hell. In one, the water had been cut off for a week, and babies hadn't been changed for five days. Albania is the um, Europe's poorest country. It's called the only third world country in Europe, and it is. I mean, the poverty in Albania is unbelievable. Nowhere is that poverty more evident than in the village of Butrint. It lies about a mile and a half across the water from the bustling holiday island of Corfu. But they're thousands of miles apart when it comes to amenities. The water comes on only once or twice a day, there are open sewers, and the electricity supply is at best intermittent. The area is home to some of Europe's most significant classical ruins. They're currently being excavated with the help of cash from Lord Rothschild and Lord Sainsbury, a name Axford also uses in his sales pitch. But the first development on this parcel of land is likely to be a holiday village, complete with luxury hotel, golf course, and possibly an airport. Nobody seems to be listening to the locals. If we're to attract people back here, we need some basic work done. The sewage system needs to be repaired, and the water and electricity supplies have to be improved. Once again, wrangles over the ownership of land threaten any development at all. While the villagers have each been given the deeds to small parcels of land, these two brothers say their families own the entire plain of Butrint. At present, we're fighting to get ourselves recognized as the rightful owners of this parcel of land, in accordance with the deeds we have in our possession. We've heard about deals to develop our land that have been signed between our government and powerful investors. We want to know what's going on. We've seen on TV and read in the newspapers that investors are flooding into Albania. But nothing is happening, which clearly means the investors are beginning to understand that nobody is talking to the true landowners, which means nothing gets done. But why does what's going on in Albania matter to us? Well, some may say Albania, a small, far-off country of which we know little. In fact, it's rather near the center of Europe, only a few miles from Italy, only a few miles from, uh, from Corfu, uh, and at the center of the volatile powder keg, which is the Balkans, with uh, outstanding problems with its neighbors, with Greece and with Serbia, with a substantial uh, Greek minority within its territory and a substantial Albanian minority within Serbian territory, any spark could set this whole area up in the way that the former Yugoslavia has burned and has been such an all-encompassing tragedy. And if Albania concludes that it's jumped out of the frying pan of bizarre communism into the fire of rapacious free market capitalism in which everyone is ripped off and everyone's a loser except the buccaneer, then that can only lead to disillusionment, instability, a disenchantment with the democratic process, and that can only be dangerous for all of us. There are no villains to confront in this particular program, unless, of course, you count the British Foreign Office, whose lack of supervision of public funds made it possible for the likes of Axford to flourish and the Foreign Office isn't saying anything. This is a program about appalling waste rather than corruption. But there are nonetheless victims, not least the British taxpayer whose money has been squandered, and of course, the Albanians themselves, who got nothing at all. Throughout the world, Albanians celebrate today, November the 28th, as Independence Day. Some who dealt with Andre Axford won't be joining in the celebrations. in baptism.